Good morning. morning. Thought we'd just start with a video about a nap. (laughs) Good to see you guys this morning. Today we're going to talk about ugly actions. And uh, if you didn't know this, and I'll explain it a little more later in the sermon, um, how many of you have ever either read The Christmas Carol or seen a movie about Christmas Carol or Scrooge? You've seen... All right, it's good to know you have slight education. That's good. It's good. You can pretend you read it. I did that a lot in school. Don't tell Danielle. She was one of my students. So imagine (laughs) I'm faking and then I'm teaching them. That's really... That's how things go downhill. But truthfully, that story changed so many things, not only in England, but even how we do Christmas and the things around Christmas. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But today I'm going to talk about the impact of actions. And here's what I want you to know. This is going to be the kind of the summary of what we're going to talk about. I want to encourage you, just like I encourage the kids, don't let your past or what's happened to you in, in the past affect today. You, you can miss what God's doing today because of what happened to you yesterday. You can't stop the actions of others from impacting you. That's part of free will, is that other people can hurt us. But what you can do is understand and, and be discerning about actions and also understand that God can work anything for the good. So uh, about a week and a half ago, I was mowing my grass and uh, there were pine cones and some small limbs probably from the hurricane on the ground. And uh, I tend to overestimate the ability of my lawnmower. Anybody else overestimate the ability? So I actually have a riding lawnmower, which is kind of a big deal. I'm so excited to have a riding lawnmower um, about a year ago. Uh, uh, well, anyway, so as I um, am riding, I see a limb with some pine cones on it, and I think, no big deal, and I hit it, and the pine cone goes into where the belt is, and it dislodges and stretches out the belt that basically makes it mow. And now I just have a riding rider, because no longer a lawnmower. And so I think, well, I can fix this, no big deal. And I take it into the garage, and I've got a light out, and I take everything apart, and I'm looking. And the belt is still on there, because there's one clip there that kind of holds the belt where it was. And I'm looking and taking the new belt and putting it next to it and thinking, I don't know how this goes. And about three hours... Uh, I stared and looked up stuff on the internet and watched videos of lawnmower people and kept thinking, well, I'm smarter than these guys, and I'm not, um, and could not figure it out. So I finally just gave up and walked away for a week, for a week. And during the week, randomly, I would look up schematic charts, and I would try to look up videos on how you put a belt on five pulleys, which look up five pulley belt, it's it's confusing and exciting all at the same time. And so I finally did that. And so yesterday I I rolled the mower out and I'm looking at it and I realized something that was holding me up. It was one thing that was holding me up and it was that the last belt was put in upside down. And so because I was looking at what the last guy did, it messed me up today because he put it in, up the idiot, put it in, upside down, it was me. The last time, apparently, I put the lawn belt in. And you know, one of the blades I didn't think was cutting real well, apparently one of them was running backwards and beating the grass to death in the middle into submission. So some of my grass was wonderfully cut and others were just abused till it fell down. And I was wondering what happened. And I, I can tell you, I, once I figured that out and I put the belt back on, it was perfect. It was easy. I, I took it out and I rolled over. The, it's amazing when you put something on right, how when it's not beating the grass into submission and actually cutting it, it's like, wow, this lawnmower works great. It's like a new lawn. I blew off my driveway with a lawnmower. I thought this thing is awesome and I'm an idiot because what did I do as I was looking at that I let how I had put the belt in before affect 
how I kept looking at it because I thought, that's got to be right. <laughs> I, it's been running, so I'm sure it was right. <laughs> right? And here's the thing about your life. There's going to be things that happen in your life. Listen, sometimes other people are going to hurt you. Some of you have memories of your past, of things that have hurt you. To be honest, sometimes we look back and we've done dumb things. And here's the key. It's to recognize where you've put things in upside down because of something that happened. And maybe, maybe even to take the time to take it all apart. And realize, I've been thinking about this the wrong way. I've been acting on this the wrong way. Maybe I've been stuck with what I did in the past. Maybe I've been stuck on not forgiving somebody who hurt me. And I'm missing today because of yesterday. And Rodney, it was not me waving my finger at you. Yellow does mean go faster. (laughs) I will tell you, if you go to Miami and you stop on a yellow light, you now will probably get a ticket for impeding traffic. They'll say that you caused the accident because you stopped too quickly. I promise you, that's how crazy it is down there. That's why you moved here. I'm just letting you know. So here's the, here's the things we're going to talk about today, the impact of actions. Number one, we need to consider the actions of others. You know, and, and sometimes we take this judge not thing too far. We think that that means we can't be discerning. You're supposed to be discerning. It's not just like, don't judge me. And, and um, uh, well, let me, let me ask you a question before I go. Uh, well, okay, let me just read this. Okay, this is from Matthew. Matthew is trying to let Jewish people know how Jesus was the Messiah. And so over and over he does that. And he does that in this section. And this is a piece of the Christmas story. Here we go. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And then it continues. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So there's a lot packed into these few verses. So What happened? Remember, the angel came, told Mary, the Holy Spirit has gotten you pregnant, which sounds crazy even when I say it today. Like, is that what he said? I thought he said, halo, blessed one, the Lord is with you or something, right? And we read that and we're like, okay. And then, and then Mary goes to Joseph and goes, hey, just so you know, an angel told me I'm pregnant with God's baby. So he says, I could have her killed, and that was not totally, it was pretty uncommon, honestly, but you could do it. So he could have had her killed for being unfaithful. They weren't officially married yet, but there was a pre-wedding time where essentially you were married. So Mary comes and says, I'm pregnant. Joseph says, well, I don't want that to happen, but I need to have her put away. You, You get it? Put away quietly because Mary just told me she's having God's baby. If I told you today I was having God's baby, you would have me put away quietly, right? (laughs) Now, just a couple things about Joseph. Joseph's awesome. We don't hear a lot about Joseph. Joseph's not mentioned in the people of faith. But wouldn't it have been nice? I'm just saying, if I was God... Shouldn't you have told Joseph first? Shouldn't you have sent an angel at some point? I mean, you sent him to Mary, and Mary's like, you, you want me to tell Joseph? You tell Joseph. But no, she tells Joseph first. And so Joseph does what? He struggles. Joseph's dealing with difficulty. Hey, can I tell you whose fault this is? God's fault. God, you could have made it easy for Mary God, you could have made it easy for Joseph, but God knew what he was doing. And what is he doing? He's building Joseph's faith. And so Joseph goes, okay, let's have her put away. Right? And then it continues. 
But after he considered this, so he's got to deal with it. You ever stress about something, freak out about something, look at a, 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 a thing on your lawnmower for a week and think, how in the world is that going to work? Or you're looking at your finances, you get a bill from the hospital. Those are my favorite bills. Your bill's $2 billion. You only owe a billion. You should be grateful. Right? But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived of her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son. You're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive, give birth to a son, and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And I'm going to be talking about that in the next few days. That's from Hosea 11.1. 1. So Joseph goes from, think about this. Joseph goes from, my wife is crazy, to, okay. Okay. He could have easily got focused on any of the things that were going on. But what was he? Every day he just said, how can I be faithful today? He was faithful to his wife. He was faithful to God. And what's happening now? Regardless of the circumstances, what's going on? He, listen, at first he's saying, I'm not sure I can trust Mary. Right? He's going to have her put away. There's a reason he's going to have her put away. Either he thinks she's crazy or he thinks she's unfaithful or she's crazy and unfaithful. And so he's going to have her put away quietly and God says, no, 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 this is all on purpose. And so Joseph is never criticized, by the way, for making a judgment call or being discerning about Mary. Why? Because he has to figure out the truth. Sometimes in life, you've got to pay attention to what's happening to know someone's motives. How many of you have ever been ripped off by a contractor or a car mechanic? <laughs> yes. And do you go back to them? No. And if you do, I worry about your discernment. Right? Right? And so the truth is we've all had somebody rip us off and God gave us discernment on purpose. And here's what I want you to learn from the first part of this. The Bible never criticizes Joseph for saying no. Some of you need a good no. Some of you need to kindly be able to say, you know what, I'm just not comfortable doing that. You know what, I'm just not so sure about that. Some of you, because when you were a kid, you were never allowed to say no to anybody, you have a hard time when anything happens saying, well, I don't think we're going to do that. Be discerning. But understand that no matter whether you're the most discerning person on earth, people can hurt you. Things can happen to you that you can't control. And God, even in that, knows all of those things. So don't let it mess you up. Just pay attention. So the first thing I want to encourage you to do is pray for godly discernment. Be kind to people, be loving to people, but be okay with sometimes going, no, we're, we're not going to give you a deposit before you work on the house of two-thirds of the cost of, right? Number two, ugly actions impact our lives. How many of you in here have a pet of some kind? I have way too many dogs in my house right now, but that's another story for another day. Years ago, I had a dog named Nikki. It was a rescue dog. Nikki loved to play fetch. But one of the most disturbing things to me was when I would play fetch with the Frisbee, I would pick up the Frisbee and I would do this. And Nikki would do that every time. For years, she would duck. And I knew that meant that someone had beaten Nikki. And I knew that anytime FPL came over too. She did not like FPL. The poor FPL man would come to the door. Can you please get your dog? I can. She's very sweet to everyone except you. Right? <laughs> but she would duck every time. Why? Because she had been hurt. Listen, some of you have been hurt and you've been impacted by what somebody did to you. And here's what I want you to learn. Sometimes in life, life is painful. Life is hard. But you get to live today. How do I know that? Listen to this. This is a, a little different kind of pain. 
Luke chapter 2, you've probably heard this. I think Linus reads it. Drops his blanket, if you've never noticed that, during this part. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. By the way, something I learned in seminary is when you have a name in the Bible, because we don't know exactly how to pronounce Greek, just go with it and be confident about it, and you can pretend you know something that somebody else does. Doesn't. So. Just saying. So next time you're reading this story and you're like, Quirinius, 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 just be confident. Quirinius. And everybody will be like, I never heard it that way. Yep, that's how it is. My pastor told me. Your pastor's an idiot. I know. All right. And everyone went to their own town to register. Everyone. Listen. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth and Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David. By the way, all of those things that he's mentioning here uh, uh, fulfill prophecies. Egypt, a little bit later, fulfills a prophecy from the Old Testament, which is crazy. Like, how can the Messiah be from that place and from that place and from that place and from that place? This is why. And then it continues. To Bethlehem, the town of David. Micah 5.2 is where that's from. Because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Now, we just read this. We imagine this little donkey ride. No big deal. You just go from one town to the other. Number one, for a normal person, three days journey. Number two, nine months pregnant. Now, we have one of our ladies... That, that was pregnant here at church not that long ago. And when she was really pregnant, I remember thinking, we're going to have a baby during church. I hope there's some people prepared. Catch, right? Imagine nine months pregnant, donkey ride. Three days minimum. I'm not wanting to do that today. My back hurts just thinking about it. And I'm not pregnant. I mean... There has been some debate about my size, but, right? Couldn't they have made an exception? Yes. But they didn't. And here's the worst part of the whole story. Jesus is born in Bethlehem because of taxes. You think your tax bill's bad. You think an audit's bad. Three days journey, nine months pregnant, that is crazy time. And here's what's incredible. This becomes a minor part of the story. And yet this is how God is using even bad people. Can we call politicians bad people? Is that evil too for me? Okay. God is using a politician to get Jesus where he wants him. And yet it doesn't make the circumstance any better. Now, Mary and Joseph could have focused on the journey, and I'm sure during the journey it was not easy. They could have focused on what's next, but what they focused on was what the purpose was. And here's the deal. You can focus on the problem all the time, or you can focus on God's purpose for you today. Yes, somebody hurts you in your past. I've had, over the years, I've been a pastor a long time, I've had people totally make things up. I had a lady one time accuse me of cussing her out. She went to the leaders of the church and they interviewed me about cussing this woman out. I was like, have you ever heard me cuss at anyone other than my children? No, I didn't say that. I, I, and, and here's what happened. She called me, was upset about something. She began cussing at me and I said, ma'am, if you continue to cuss, I'm going to hang up and you can call me back when you calm down. She continued to cuss at me. I said, ma'am, if you continue to cuss at me, I'm going to hang up and you can call me back when you calm down. She kept cussing at me and guess what I did? This is old school. So she called the leaders of the church and said, the pastor cussed me out. Now, I promise you I didn't cuss her out. I promise you after that I wanted to cuss her out. It doesn't help. But the truth is, she just made it up. I would love to tell you that's the worst thing that anybody ever made up. I, I wish I could tell you that's the worst thing that I've ever been told. My friend Rudy says it this way. He says, but Eric, think about this. What if they really knew the truth about the worst thing you'd ever done? I'm like, cussing somebody out is fine. Right? 
When we look at life sometimes, we focus so much on what somebody did to us that was wrong that we can't enjoy what God is doing today. Some of you have missed a lot of family dinners because you're focused on what happened earlier in the day. Some of you have missed a lot of family relationships because of one silly little thing that happened earlier that right now you're still mad about that thing, not realizing that you only have so many moments. Quit wasting them on something that happened before. Sometimes you've got to take the thing apart and turn the belt the right way, and it takes some time. And sometimes you're the one that has to say, I'm sorry. And sometimes you just need to get over it and say, I can't go back and fix that, but I can forgive and be forgiven. Pray for God's guidance in trials. Pray for God's guidance in trials. I read an Icelandic proverb I had never read uh, this morning. It said, if you cry because the sun is gone from your life, you won't be able to see the stars. If you're so focused on what was wrong this morning, you won't be able to see the good tonight. And listen, life is hard sometimes. But I promise you, if you focus on the storm, you won't walk on water. And by the way, God doesn't calm the storm before he lets you walk on water. And every walking on water in the Bible took place during a storm. And when God really does amazing things in your life, sometimes it's going to be during the storm. Pray for God's guidance in trials. Uh, somebody texted me yesterday dealing with a tough situation at their home. And here's what I said to them. All you can do is do what's right on your end. All you can do is sweep your side of the street. You, you can do the best you can on your end. And that's all you're responsible for. You can't make their choices. You can't make them change. You can't make them do what you want them to. But wouldn't that be great? Exactly. Number three. God works all together for the good. Let me ask you a question. We're at the end of the year almost. By the way, I have two services this week. No service next Sunday morning. But we will be back here for New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Hope you can make it. But if you could look back at 2022, which we're almost out of, what would you edit? What would you go back and take out? Something that happened to you? I can tell you of three hospital stays that I would love to just edit. You should see the bills. They're awesome. The good news is they were all in the same year. I've gone to the hospital in December and January before. Try not to do that if you can help it. They give you deductibles for both years when you do that. Right? What would you edit this year if you could? I wish you could. But I can tell you that God can use whatever it is that happened to you that's horrible for good. Listen to what happens next. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger. I figure you've heard this before. Because there was no room for them in the inn. I, I read it in King James without reading it. All right. And there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. It'll be great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find the baby on a throne in a castle. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. A manger is basically a feeding trough. Some people say they were wood. Some people said they were stone. What's really funny is they've only found stone ones. So people say, well, they were all stone. I say, you think wood lasts that long? Just saying. Oh, sorry. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God. Saying, I wish I'd said they sung it, but they sang it. They said it. On whom his favor rests. When the angel left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And you read the rest of the story. And remember, Mary ponders all these things in her heart. <laughs> Can I tell you that Mary was not sitting there when the shepherds came and said, we just got off that dumb donkey. You with me? 
If you've ever been a part of a birth, whether it's your child, grandchild, friend's child, it's amazing how painful childbirth is. And it's amazing how quickly that's forgotten. Until the next time. It's amazing what the focus becomes. No longer is it on the pain, it's on this new child. Can I tell you something? Every moment in your life is a new baby being born. And I know the last moment may have been painful. And I know the last season may have been painful. And I know someone may have hurt you. And I know you may have been through a trial. And I know you may have been through a struggle. And I know somebody treated you unfairly. And I know you might have done something really dumb. But I want you to forgive, be forgiven, and enjoy today. To recognize the blessing God has given you how can I do that? Because Romans 8, 28 says, We know that in all things God works to the good of those who love Him, who've been called according to this purpose. This verse does not say everything that happens to you is good. Anybody like to edit something from this year? Anybody? Wouldn't that be great? You could just edit, right? Just go back. I'm going to fix this. This person's alive again. This person's not alive. No, I don't know. We wouldn't do that. Right? Right? I wouldn't say that dumb thing. I wouldn't do that dumb thing. Right? Whatever it is, you could edit it, but you can't. But here's what I know. Not everything is good, but God can work it out for the good. How do I know that? Charles Dickens, who wrote The Christmas Carol, was not a perfect man. But he understood what it was like to be poor. And he understood what it was like to work in a workhouse as a child. Because when he was about 11 or 12 years old, his parents were thrown into debtor's prison. And he was taken to a workhouse where he was forced to work as a child, hour after hour, in terrible conditions, with rats at his feet. And if you read the Christmas carol, there's a section of the Christmas carol where it talks about the chains going up and down the stairs, and it sounded like rats running up and down the stairs. How would he know that? Because he had sat in a room with rats running up and down the stairs. And he understood what it was like to be poor. And so when wealthy people, as he became more and more wealthy, and as he began to hang around wealthy people, and he began to hear them say, why is Christmas such a big deal? All they want to do is, is pick our pockets on the 25th of December. Why should we care about the poor? Aren't there workhouses? How was he able to do that? Because he recognized everything bad that had happened to him could now be turned around to help people understand that at Christmas time we should open our hearts to the poor and the hurting. Of all the times of year, the time where the wise men came and brought gifts is the time that we should give gifts to others who need it to help them. We would not have Christmas today the way we have Christmas if it wasn't for Charles Dickens and for him using his experience. So here's the question for you. What experience have you had that God wants to use for you to be a blessing to someone else? Finally today, I want you to thank God for how and that he is always working. So no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've dealt with, God can use it for the good. So let him. Quit dwelling where you used to live and begin dwelling today and saying, God, what do you want me to do with what you've taught me, with the pain I'm dealing with, with the struggle I'm dealing with, the difficulty I've had? Help me use it for the good. Millions of people have been inspired by the Christmas carol. And people can be inspired by your life. So live it today. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that's the first step to redemption and forgiveness and living every moment to the fullest. If you want to do that today, I'll be here after the service and you can say, I know Jesus died and rose again. I'm a sinner. I'm messed up. I'm broken. I need a savior. I surrender my life to you, Jesus. Maybe you want to do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service. Maybe you're here today and the truth is there's some unforgiveness in your heart, maybe towards somebody or maybe even somebody in the mirror. Forgive. Ask God to help you to forgive and begin to move forward. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for these moments together. I thank you for the life you've given us. Lord, so many times in life we get focused on the thing that's broken. So often we get focused on the person that hurt us. Sometimes we even focus on the dumb thing that we've done. Lord, remind us this time of year 
that you bring forgiveness, that you bring grace, that you came to touch us. Let us reach out and be a blessing to others. Give us the strength to do that today. In Jesus' name, amen.